Disappearance of adorable little Kyron Corman. As the search for the seven-year-old boy continues, his dad drops a bombshell. Kane Horman has just filed for divorce from Kyron's stepmom. He also just got a restraining order against her. And reports are he has moved out of their marital home, taking their 18-month-old daughter with him. We know that Kyron's stepmom, Terry Horman, was the very last person to see the little boy at his school before he vanished. She has not been named a suspect or a person of interest, but she she seems to have become the central focus of the investigation. Police have spent hours on end interrogating her. Chiron vanished from his Portland school more than three weeks ago. Recently, his dad talked about staying positive. Listen to this. We focus on the positive ones. He is somewhere, hopefully with someone who is taking care of him. Yeah. Um, and he's protected and safe. But that was before he decided to file for divorce. What changed? Did he learn something about his missing son's case? Cops have now given his wife, Kyron's stepmom, Terry Horman, two, count them, two polygraphs. They have searched her house. They've searched her vehicle. They told the public they doubt this is a stranger abduction. Until now, the family has shown a united front. But tonight, Kyron's family is totally fractured. What pushed Kyron's dad to do this smack in the middle of the search for his son? Does he know something we don't? What's your theory? We're taking your calls on this. one 877 says that's one 7297 Straight out to my fantastic panel. All experts on this case. But first, straight out to reporter Cor Harland, who is live in front of Kyron's school. Cor, what is the very latest? Well, Jane, uh... You sort of outlined just about everything that happened in terms of the uh, the uh, really surprise announcement that uh, Kane Harmon was seeking a divorce last night, and in the process of all of that, got a restraining order as well. The one bit of info that I can fill in for you in between what you just read there was sort of the uh, the requirements in the state of Oregon to get a restraining order, and uh, what hasn't been said really about all of this is that a uh, uh, restraining order in the state of Oregon requires three things really, and they are as follows. That abuse has occurred in a family situation there in the, during the last six months. That the person seeking the restraining order feels that more abuse may be imminent and that uh, the family uh, has a domestic family type situation there. So while nobody has really said anything officially about why this has happened or why he was seeking a divorce, uh, the requirements for the restraining order say quite a bit and they speak quite loudly to that situation. All right. Well, uh, Kane Horman filed for divorce citing irreconcilable differences and a breakdown of marriage. He's asking for sole custody of their 18-month-old daughter. The Oregonian newspaper reports that his wife, Terry, had a DUI arrest in 2005. She pleaded guilty and took a diversion course. But Mike Brooks, law enforcement analyst, the big headline to me is this restraining order that the reporter just talked about. Uh, Kane Horman's Kyron's dad. Okay, he gets a restraining order against his own wife, and he announces he's divorcing her smack in the middle of the search right. for this child. To me, it says, Mike, he has learned something new about this woman. You're absolutely right, James. Something has happened because, as we know, irreconcilable differences and the breakdown down of a marriage, they don't happen overnight. You know, was it because they found out something possibly in one of the two polygraphs? You know, that may have led to this and his total separation and just wanting her not to get anywhere near, you know, him and the other child. Something had to have happened, Jane. Jack Trimarco, former FBI profiler and polygraph expert. She has been given, as we've said now, two polygraphs. Would law enforcement, and I, this is a total hypothetical, if, if, if she failed both polygraphs, would law enforcement tell the husband, and you're looking at the husband and wife there now that are filing for divorce, would they tell the husband, hey, your wife just failed two polygraphs and, you know, do the math? Well, Jane, um, I, I can't speak for the locals, but uh, FBI uh, polygraph examiners, uh, management probably would not share with the family. Of course, uh, they have to err on the side of safety for the child that remains in the home. And, uh, and so, all things being considered, if she failed the polygraph, and I think there's a strong likelihood that she did, mm -hmm. um, 
because there's been no press conference by Terry uh, saying, hey, I passed the polygraph test, get off my back. So it's not so much what has been said in this case, it's what has not been said. She well, probably let me ask you failed this. Why do you give two polygraphs? Why, why give a second polygraph? What's the normal reason for that? Well, usually there's only one. And that would be, are you responsible for the disappearance of Chiron? Um, and then explain what a disappearance means and responsibility means. And well, I guess what I'm fails, saying is why, why would they give her a second set of polygraph questions? Well, the reason is uh, we don't know if there was a second set. It may have been the same exam done twice. And the reason for that would be if the first exam was inconclusive or, or no opinion. In other words, the examiner ran the test, ran uh, the charts several times and did not come up with a conclusion. And so that would necessitate a second test. Or there's a second issue. In polygraph, you don't cross issues. And so the first one might be responsibility. The second might be, do you know where Chiron is now? And so it's a separate issue which would uh, demand a second test. Now, she is quoted as saying, a lifelong friend described Terry's, quote, unhappiness with a second polygraph test. Uh, Stacy Honowitz, can you translate that for us? That's all we know. A lifelong friend described Terry's, quote, unhappiness with a second polygraph test. Well, I mean, certainly it's, it's, I think, commonsensical to think that she might have thought that she failed the polygraph test. She was not truthful in her answers. And I think in this case, what you have are actions speaking louder than any words. Any action taken by this husband to get a restraining order, and that restraining order has to be based on some type of abuse. There is information that, she ha that he has that is being held close to the vest because it's my understanding this is sealed that there is information that there might have been abuse between her and this child missing and now they don't want any future abuse between her and this other child but certainly this information of a divorce and a restraining order throughout the investigation of a missing child speaks volumes nancy ohio your question your thought ma'am why kane i don't understand i am a mother a grandmother and a great grandmother and i have taken all the children to school and I see them straight into their room, and I wave to the teacher so that she knows they're there, and I leave. And then we have a truant officer also that if the child doesn't show up, they call home to find out why. I think it's an excellent question. Michelle Sagona, what do you know about that day at school? I can tell you that I spoke with Matt Shelby, who is in charge of that particular school district. He says and has confirmed to me a couple of times that at least one staff member and Kyron's teacher did in fact see him at the school that morning with Terry, uh, Terry Moulton Horman, and they were walking around visiting the science fair. Uh, from that particular point, we know that he did not show up for his class uh, his, when, by the time classes started at 8.45 that morning, and that she and her husband did in fact call police at 3.45 that afternoon. But it's a great question because if the teacher did in fact see Kyron at the school that morning and he didn't show up for class, why wasn't there a red flag raised? And also, it was not an ordinary day at this school. This was a day that they were having a science fair and you were saying, Michelle Sagona, the doors were open to the public. It wasn't like people had to sign in, right? For 45 Briefly? minutes, that's correct. They were. It's like a PTA meeting in the evening. The doors were open to the public. A window of opportunity. So is the stepmom being railroaded? All right, she is not a suspect. She has not been named a person of interest, but she is the focus. Everyone stay right where you are. It's a compelling 